We are joined by six candidates running in next Tuesday's election for the U.S. Senate, uh, who, according to the standard we've always used, polled at least 5% in order to qualify to be on this stage this evening. They are in alphabetical order. Charles Bustani, Foster Campbell, David Duke, Caroline Fayard, John Fleming, and John Kennedy. Since we have so much ground to cover and so many candidates, our format uh, is this tonight for the questions. We'll allow one minute responses. Um, candidates will take generally the same question with one round of candidate specific questions. At the moderator's discretion, there will be some give and take, but we are going to try to move this along certainly. The order of the candidate answers and the order of their closing statements at the end were each decided by separate lux of the draw. I'm joined tonight by my colleagues from my Raycom uh, uh, media stations, Greg Merriweather of WA of BTV in Baton Rouge, Cynthia Arsenault of KPLC in Lake Charles, and the first question, again, by luck of the draw, goes to Mr. Fleming from Doug Warner of KSLA in Shreveport. Uh, Mr. Fleming. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, just days ago, the White House announced skyrocketing premiums for most families on affordable health care. If you support Obamacare, and the, of course all will address this eventually, how would you propose saving it if you oppose it, would you be in favor of uh, keeping popular provisions like pre-existing conditions and ensuring children to the age 26? And how would you pay for that? Mm -hmm. Well, look, as a physician, as a conservative, as someone who actually provides health care insurance through my business, I can tell you that I was there through the entire Obamacare debate. It has become an abysmal failure. It takes away the options from the American people. Instead, there are mandates. Um, it has driven up the cost of care. It's taking people away from their doctors and away from their insurance companies. I believe in the American dream, where Americans can choose their own insurance, where we have a free marketplace, not only of ideas, but of things they can achieve. As a true conservative, I want to take conservative ideas, Louisiana ideas, to Washington. You know, when I was growing up, my dad suddenly died while I was uh, still in high school. I had to become the breadwinner all of a sudden. I joined the military. I uh, opened up my own medical practice, became a doctor, and ultimately created 500 Louisiana jobs. Uh, so I came through adversity and I enjoyed the American dream. I achieved it for me and I want to go to Washington and fight for the people of Louisiana, families of Louisiana, and let them enjoy their American dream right. as well. Let's Thank go to you. Ms. Uh, Ms. Fayard with her response. Sure. Let me just answer that question briefly because there's something else that I need to mention tonight before we get started in today's debate, tonight's debate. First and foremost is the Affordable Care Act needs to be tweaked. We're not going to repeal it. It's been up to the Supreme Court twice, and it's gotten over 300,000 hardworking Louisianans health insurance. We need to cap skyrocketing premiums, and we can do that by increasing the small business subsidies and allowing more young people to get in the pool by having the individual mandate. But what's more important is the day that I spent this morning with a bunch of school children who asked me about this United States Senate race. And they wanted to know, was there a bad guy that I was running against? And I said, yes, there's one. His name is David Duke. And unfortunately, he's on this stage tonight. And as a result, the eyes of the nation and the world are upon us. And this snake has slithered out of the swamp, probably because the career politicians on this stage haven't done their job effectively enough. But I'm here to tell those school children and everybody who cares about the future of Louisiana that on November 8th, the voters of Louisiana are going to join with me and cut the head off of his hatred once and for all. All right, the uh, next uh, question or the next uh, response from Mr. Kennedy. Let me be very clear. Obamacare is an unmitigated disaster. When Congress and the President passed it, they told us it would make our lives better. They told us health insurance should be cheaper, more accessible. It's made our lives worse. We need to rip it out by the roots and start over. In its place, we need a patient-centered health care delivery system that looks like somebody designed the thing on purpose. We need more choice. We need more competition. We need more transparency. People need to know how much health care costs. We need less fraud. We need uh, to repeal the McCarran-Ferguson Act of, of uh, the 1940s that prohibits people from buying health insurance across state lines. We need more health savings accounts. We need more high-risk pools that are affordable. We need to block grant Medicaid to the states so they can experiment and try what's, what works. We need more federally qualified health centers. 
We need a health care delivery system that looks like somebody right. designed it on purpose. Wrap, please. Uh, Mr. Campbell, you're next. Thank you. This is a good question. <clears throat> uh, I have a son who's a neurosurgeon in Shreveport. His name is Peter Campbell. I asked Peter about this. I said, what about it, Peter? He told me, he said, Dad, let me just tell you something. There's more good than bad in Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. Well, there's a lot of good things about it. We need to do more to, to fix it now. We, we need to add more young people in the mix where the rates can go down. I'm a small business person. I'll do everything I can to cut the rates. But it reminds me of 1965 when everybody wanted to get rid of uh, Medicare or Medicare was going to be terrible. Now everybody's covered by Medicare, so I would not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'll do some fixing on it. Uh, but I'm, I'm surprised uh, that Mrs. Fayard said she was talking to those kids today. That's good when you talk to kids. You should have told those kids that you lied about my relationship with David Duke because that's exactly what it was. It was a big lie. When you talk to those kids next time, tell them that you don't mind lying sometimes. All right, Mr. Duke, you're next. Well, I'd like to comment on Obamacare, obviously, but I would like a short rebuttal to what she said. Uh, we were said that we could have a rebuttal if somebody said that you beat your dog, and she kind of said that's worse that, than that's that. Fine. I'll that, talk that, about that's fine. Lies. The clock is rolling, though, so go ahead. Okay, so I have a minute, and then I and then I can come back with my Obamacare question. You have one minute total, sir. Take one the minute time, total. Take the time as you please. Well, yeah, but I thought I would have a chance to rebut uh, what she said. I want to talk about Obamacare for the minute, like everybody let else. Explain, let me explain to the panel. We're going to try to cover a lot of territory. It right. would be an enormous disservice to the voters and to the candidates yep. if this becomes a referendum on one candidate. You have one minute, sir. About 45 seconds left. Please go. Well, sir, I object first off because you said we had a chance to rebut if someone made a direct attack against you. And that's taking away from my Obamacare time. That's improper. And that's, this is please, the kind of fixed Mr. politics please, we have please, in this country. Please make your point. Now, please. I'll make the point. All right, first off, yeah, I'm the bad guy because I defend the people of this country that made this country great, gave us a constitution and our freedom, and we're losing our rights in America. All I've ever said is I say respect for all people, but also you must respect the people who built this great nation and we shouldn't face massive discrimination. That's not a bad guy. Now, as far as Obamacare is concerned, Obamacare is actually as every program in the government, it's always the hard-working middle class who gets the shaft. We, you know, the Republicans talk about socialized medicine, but we already have it. But we have socialized medicine only for the welfare recipients and for the illegal aliens. The first way to protect the system, yes, we need to repair and, re in fact, replace, end and replace Obamacare, but the first right. way to stop this is to stop the illegal aliens from going to any hospital right, they you, want I to, you, I you and that gives us time. the money to I save you a little the extra time. There, sir. That, okay, that's it. Let's you. go to Mr. Bustan. All right. Thank you. First, let me uh, thank Dillard University for hosting this under very regrettable circumstances. As a heart surgeon with the years of clinical experience, I led two open heart operating teams, and we actually enhanced quality, lowered cost, and, and brought both of those hospitals to top 100 status. I know how to do this. And in my time in Congress, I actually inflicted the largest repeal of a part of Obamacare to date, saving $86 billion to the taxpayer in a faulty program. Look, if you want to fix health care, put the focus on the doctor-patient relationship because that's how you get to the highest quality. And all coverage should lead to a high-quality doctor-patient relationship. Short of that, we're going to get something like Obamacare where everybody's upset, cost is skyrocketing, quality is suffering. Secondly, you've got to have information. You have to have a wide range of choices, not restrictive choices. And you need to put the family back in control, not bureaucrats and not Washington, not uh, insurance agents and others. The family should be in control of health care. Would, would you, thank you, sir, your time has expired. A quick follow-up, Mr. Bustani. Would you keep in pre-existing condition coverage, and how would you pay for it? Well, with pre-existing conditions, we actually offered a better way to do this with high-risk pools that were uh, basically funded appropriately. We believe we can take the cost out of this if you focus on quality. The, the way the Democrats did it in Obamacare is one of the most expensive ways to do this, and now we're seeing adverse selection and the cost of skyrocketing. We need to take care of all, all individuals with, indivi uh, with uh, pre-existing conditions, but do it in a high-quality, cost-effective right. way. Is it, is it possible, Mr. Fleming, to do that? Can you really allow for pre-existing conditions well, and not have a funding of all, mechanism? Uh, first of all, I disagree somewhat with Mr. Bus uh, Dr. Bustani on this. He believes that it can be fixed, Obamacare. I didn't get to my final the part of this. and should be replaced by market-based 
patient-centered system. Okay, but the follow-up, the follow-up Yes, question and we can do that, yes, but we have to use a market-based system. We have to give options and choices to patients, but we can do it by high-risk pools. We can also do it by grouping small businesses together. Yes, we can achieve that. As many, if not more, people can and, be covered and, under our and plan. And Mr. Kennedy, you were the other one who sort of left the, 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 the other part of the question. Yes, Dangling, you, does you, Santa Claus rain down, or how do you pay no, you, to cover pre-existing conditions? No, you can pay conditions? for it, and let me tell you how you pay for it. I read the federal budget just like I read the state budget. Let me tell you some of the things the United States Congress has appropriated money for. $6.5 million no, to study the me, effects sir. of Swedish Wait, massages Kennedy, on Kennedy, bunny please, rabbits. If I can. The question is, how are you going to pay to ensure pre-existing conditions and, if you eliminate Obama? And I'm answering that. I'm telling you how to save the money in the budget. $6.5 million to study the effects of Swedish massages on bunny rabbits. $750,000 Congress appropriated money to build a soccer field for Guantanamo Bay Terrace. Congress spent $753 million to remodel a single building for Congress. Congress spent $300,000 for a cheese heritage so, so you're suggesting there to is honor that much, the you're, history of cheese. You're suggesting there is that much waste there. Absolutely. There is, there is um, $125 billion worth of overpayments in the federal budget. All right, I'm, I'm, let me I'm, give you, can I give you one more example? There are 6.5 million people with active social security numbers who supposedly are 112 years of old or older. 6.5 million people in America who are 112 where, and older getting social security getting benefits. That, I think it's called fraud. I'm getting that from the Inspector General of the United States. All right, let me move on to the next area because we've got to cover, an, we've got to cover another area. Let's go to a tax question. The first response is from Ms. Fayard and that's from Cynthia Arsenault. Ms. Fayard and the other candidates, one of the deepest divides in the presidential race is the question of taxes, with Hillary Clinton vowing to raise taxes on the wealthiest Americans to pay for new investments, and then Donald Trump vowing to cut corporate and individual taxes and the estate tax. What is your view on this, and, and how do you make taxes fair and create jobs, but at the same time not wreak havoc on the budget? Sure, that's a great question. Trickle-down economics, as Mr. Trump has proposed, do not work. It's been disproven over and over again. We have to make sure that the tax code is fair and reasonable for all hardworking Americans, which means that those at the very top, which often includes myself, have to pay their fair share. And we're going to do that by doing a couple of tax reforms, simple tax reforms. We can close the carried interest loophole, which is something that affects the uber wealthy, and we can reform the state tax. It's something that we have to do to make sure that our working families are taken care of because it's, it's not correct when someone who just relies on passive income pays a lower rate than someone, a truck driver or a nurse or someone who's actually out manufacturing and making things. And frankly, as a small business owner, I do recognize that small businesses have challenges. 97% of our businesses in Louisiana are small businesses. What we're going to do is make it easier for them to access capital. We're going to allow them to quadruple the startup deduction, and we're going to make make sure that they're able to employ more people by investing in their businesses and paying, frankly, a living wage, which will help our economy get going. All right, Mr. Kennedy, you're next. Here's the problem with the tax code. Here's the problem with the economy. We've got too many undeserving people at the top getting bailouts, and we've got too many undeserving people at the bottom getting handouts. And the rest of us in the middle get stuck with the bill. And we can't pay it anymore. Because thanks to Obamacare, our health insurance has gone up, our kids' tuition has gone up, our taxes have gone up, but you know what hadn't gone up? Our income. Median household income in America today is actually less than it was in 2002. Here's what we need to do to the tax code and to the economy. We need to help the middle class. The problem, I, I support reducing taxes across the board, but the problem with most tax cut plans is it only helps the very rich and it adds to the deficit. I want a tax plan that helps everybody, but especially, especially the middle class, people making $100,000 or less. It can be done and I can tell you how we'll pay for it. All right, Mr. Campbell. Taxes. I'm the only one up here that's willing to let you see how much I make and how much taxes I paid. Nobody else will do that. I've offered my taxes. I want you to take a real good look at it. I pay about 30 percent taxes. Nobody else wants to talk about it while we're talking about taxes. Uh, offshore, uh, big corporations have about $2.1 trillion 
overseas or wherever they keep it that has no taxes been paid on it. $2.1 trillion. Now, we're out of balance about $500 billion a year. $500 billion a year. If we would make these large corporations pay taxes instead of moving them offshore, uh, we could go a long ways about balancing the budget and firing up our tax uh, situation in Louisiana and in the United States of America. I c can show you how to give tax relief to the middle if you'll make some of the giant corporations that take their money offshore and pay no taxes. I don't know anybody out there has got an offshore account. I don't. Maybe somebody up here does, but I pay my taxes and I've proved it. I'll show them to you. All right, Mr. Duke. Mr. Uh, Kennedy, I'm, I'm not quite sure if your name is uh, John or Teddy because your record shows you were a massive tax supporter. In fact, you with Buddy Romer supported the destruction of our homestead exemption by constitutional amendment. When I got in there, they, I was called by Shahardi and also Sheriff Lee. I traveled the state and I helped stop that amendment which saved every one of you watching this program right now thousands and thousands of dollars if, if we would have, you would have lost if the homestead exemption which you fought for with Buddy Romer w would have passed. So we have to protect the middle class person, the productive person in this country. It's the same message I gave years ago and you know what folks, I was right. And all these guys here and, and the lady, they're all beholden to the special interest, the big money. That's who controls American politics, and that's what's got to end, and that's what you can do by voting for All right, Mr. thank you. I'm, I'm going to give Mr. Kennedy a chance to respond, but I'm going to continue to go in the order at the moment. So let's go to Mr. Bustani at the moment. We'll, get, we'll circle back. Thank you. I chair the Tax Policy Subcommittee in, in Congress right now, and we've actually worked very hard over the years talking to families across this country who understand that the tax code is unfair, it's grossly complicated, it's filled with special interest carve-outs, and average families are getting hurt really bad. What we need to do is real tax reform, something that hasn't been done since Ronald Reagan was president 30 years ago. And what that's going to take is to lower the rates, simplify the code, go to a much flatter rate structure, eliminate a lot of the special interest carve-outs, and uh, eliminate the, uh, the alternative minimum tax, which hits a lot of families unfairly. We need to lower the corporate tax rate, which is the highest in the world, and it's forcing jobs overseas and trapping capital overseas that can't come back and invest in manufacturing here. We have a way to do it. It's called uh, A Better Way. It's been a product of my subcommittee, working with uh, Speaker Ryan. It's a really good plan. And in fact, if we get John Donald Trump as president, we're going to pass tax reform once and for all because it's long overdue. All right. And Mr. Fleming. Yeah. As a small business owner, I know the devastating effects of taxes. As a conservative, I see how it kills jobs. And, you know, I was talking the other day with my chief financial officer about all of the damaging effects of taxes and so forth. But, you know, Mr. Kennedy, if you were my chief financial officer, You'd be fired a long time ago. What does sweetest massages on bunny rabbits have to do with financing of health care, for heaven's sakes? Now, what about the $1 billion surplus the state had that then turned into a $1.6 billion deficit? Again, that was under your control and under your rule. And what about the $400,000 of rent per year paid for this plush office downtown in Baton Rouge when you could be paying zero rent in the capital? and $300,000 worth of fine art that you criticized Bobby Jindal for buying in the first place. So again, I don't think you're quite right for prime time when it comes to serving in the U.S. Senate. You need to go back and learn a little bit more, Mr. Kennedy, right. about finance. Your time has expired, Mr. Kennedy. Your response. Um, I, I really like John, but, but John is the ultimate Washington insider. And Washington insiders quite often don't tell the American people the truth. Everything John just said is a lie. Let me, let me re remark on what Mr. Duke said. Mr. Duke is a convicted liar. Mr. Duke is a convicted felon. My ballot number is 13. His federal prison number is 282-13034. He spent time in prison for lying to his supporters. He swindled them out of their money and took that money and used it for his gambling addiction. Everything Mr. Duke said is an unmitigated lie. All right. And one more point. It must be terrible to wake up in the morning with that much hate in your heart. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. 
I'm, I'm going to go down this path against my better judgment and let Mr. Duke respond. I, again, want to keep this as something other than a referendum on any one candidate, but I will, I will respond as well. Let's go with Mr. Duke. Very quickly, Mr. Duke, in 15 seconds, if you can, please, sir. And Mr. Fleming was right, too. Look, I was targeted by the government, yes. And even the Republicans standing up here have admitted in Congress that the government of this country is used in tax and other matters against Mr. enemies. Mr. Duke, if I may, you were targeted by the government. Well, I'm going to finish it, please. This is not please. a one-minute response. Would you not this interrupt me and give me my time? This is not time. an open discussion, you're not, Look, you're this not one of the debaters here. I'm this, sorry, this Mr. Snell. You're the moderator. Here's you gave the deal. me a chance Duke, to rebut, and you're interrupting me. Here's what I'd like you me. to rebut, sir. Let me rebut. Federal prosecutors said, sir, that what you did, sir. You see, you're not a moderator. You're a typical media All right, we're going to move on. Well, Mr. No, yeah, Fleming, go ahead. Your time, me now? You're going to silence me now? You're going to silence me? Again. You're going to prevent me from answering this question I'd because like you, you want to make a point? I'd like you to answer the question that I would direct you to. I have a right Mr. Fleming has a floor. Go ahead, sir. Look, yes. Mr. Snell, I have a right to respond. You, you, because you didn't like my response, you interrupt me. Look, the, that's the problem in this country. The media is deciding who, who our candidates Here's what are. Here's what prosecutors said, sir. Which Let you me answer pled, the question. You pled guilty, uh, sir, no, look, to a wait, 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 wait. That you You're not even letting me you, answer. I'm trying to get you. Here's the question I want you to answer. No, no, no. Here's no, the sir. Question. No, sir. I want to answer one this, time Mr. at a time. The, the beauty of this, Mr. Duke, no, is that I get to answer. Okay, never mind. No, sir. You're a hypocrite. Mr. Fleming, please, sir, go. You have the floor. I was going to answer that question if you gave me the chance. You Mr. Fleming has the floor. Mr. Fleming, I, you I, didn't. I have the no, floor. I get a Mr. Fleming, no, the sir. Mr. Fleming no, has sir. the floor. I get a chance to answer the question. You, you didn't even give me the chance to make my statement. Everybody make, watching Make your at statement home very quickly. Knows the fact. Okay, I'll answer. Here's the answer. Okay. Yes, the federal government targeted me, and they target anybody in this country and would who stands up and says these things. And these Republicans, conservatives, have been targeted. How much do you think the federal government hates me? And uh, I, in fact, I've got the tax uh, form that was sent to me. They audited me, and they determined that I overpaid my taxes by $6,000. But you don't know that. The people don't know that of this state. Listen, here's the issue. The truth is that anybody who stands up in this country and tells the truth what's happening to our country, we're losing our country. Anybody who does that is going to be a target of the media, just like Donald Trump. All right, let, just we watch move what's on. happening let's, to Donald Trump. Let's go to Trump. Mr. Fleming, please, quickly. Okay, now, uh, Mr. Kennedy calls me a liar rather than answering the claims. Well, we, it's all well documented. Also, what about the Superdome fiasco, the bond fiasco, the very industry that's provided over $700,000? of contributions to your state campaign, which probably made its way somehow into this Senate campaign. Uh, $108 million of wasted taxpayer money. And you said, well, it could have been more. I, I think that's disgraceful. Again, if you were my chief financial officer, you would have been fired a all long right, time all right. ago. We've, we've got to move on. We have now a question on a candidate specific questions to an individual candidate, beginning with Mr. Kennedy and Greg Merriweather. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, uh, you refer to yourself as a conservative. You mm -hmm. tag out your commercials with it. Um, in 2004, obviously, you supported a classic liberal Democrat, John Kerry, for president. I'm curious, which of his philosophies did you admire? Um, I'm a member of the NRA. I'm pro-life. I believe in uh, smaller government. It was impossible for me to remain a Democrat. I, uh, I left the Democratic Party when it was no longer possible to be a conservative Demo Democrat. Mr. Kennedy, um, Mr. if, if, if I could, we, let me, we'll go ahead and let everybody have one minute on the floor on the first, and then we'll follow up. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer. Um, just give me a second. Um, I'm not the only uh, Democrat who became a Republican. Uh, Ronald Reagan got fed up. Governor Romer left the Democratic Party to become a Republican. Governor Mike Foster did. Uh, Senator Bill Cassidy, our current senator, used to be a Democrat. Um, ben, ben uh, uh, Carson, Donald Trump, uh, Billy Tozan. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and I just could no longer in good conscience remain a Democrat. Since we had, since we had some confusion a moment ago, if we can, Greg, let me, let me clear this up because this may be my fault. Just so everybody's on the same page here, the format is that we direct a question to you, the candidate has one minute. Then there is an open discussion and a give and take. You no longer control the floor. If, you, if, the, if, if I believe you're not directing the question, 
I may interrupt you. We'll try to get everybody to have a fair shot at answering a question. Greg, you've got to follow up. Yeah, well, I just specifically want to know what was it about the Democratic Party that attracted you in the first place? Uh, when, when I became a Democrat, uh, just about everybody in Louisiana was a Democrat. Uh, I have always been conservative. I've always been fiscally conservative. I've always been a supporter of the Second Amendment. I've always believed in more freedom, not more free stuff. And it was possible years ago, hard for, for some young people to realize this, uh, to be a, be a conservative Democrat. Those days are no more. I'm not putting Democrats down. This is America. You can be anything you want to be. But I'm just telling you, I can no longer be a Democrat. Uh, wasn't, wasn't peculiar to me. Ronald Reagan, I think, went through the same thought process, uh, as did two governors in Louisiana. All right. We need to move on. Let's get a question for Mr. Campbell from Doug Warner. Kind of in that uh, same vein, it turns out. Over the years, Louisiana has turned more and more conservative. Uh, come Tuesday night, if the Senate swings to uh, the Democratic side, you'll be voting for people who are considered liberal leaders who may not reflect a lot of the views of the people of Louisiana. Coming from a red state, philosophically, what is it about the Democratic Party that's appealing to you? Well, first of all, let me just talk about Mr. Kennedy a second. I went to Mr. Kennedy's office uh, about 20 years ago or 15 years ago, and he had a huge picture of Earl Long on the wall. And I asked him, I said, John, what you got Earl Long's picture on the wall for? He said, oh, that's the wave of the future, black voters and Hispanic voters. That's what Mr. Kennedy told me, just for the record, just for the record. Now I'm a Democrat, and I've never changed, and I'm not changing. I'm a conservative Democrat. I believe in saving money. I don't have any tap dancing shoes on. I am a Democrat. I'm proud of it. Let me tell you this, though. I'm the one that's created billion-dollar trust funds. I didn't vote for all the taxes that's come through the legislature. I voted for fewer taxes than Jay Darden did, a lot of them. But I can tell you this, I'm not ashamed of being a Democrat. Democrats represent the working men and women, and I am for working men and women. So that's, that's what I am. I've been able to get reelected in North Louisiana time and time again. People know who I am. They know I take up for the little guy, and I'm very proud of it. I have a big badge. I am for the little guy, the guy that doesn't have a big voice, All right. and I wear it right here. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. L let me ask a question to Mr. Duke here, and, and since you brought up the media, let me approach it. I'll kind of ad lib a little something here. Okay. Um, media criticism is fair. There was a lot of media criticism, for example, from Trump supporters who believed that there was way too much coverage of the uh, open microphone and the comments that were made about women by Mr. Duke uh, to Billy Bush. On, on by your, Mr. Duke, on your, you mean Mr. Let Trump, me, let me, right? Right. You said by Mr. Duke. To by, excuse, I'm so, so sorry. Excuse me. I haven't by made Mr. those by comments no, yet. Sir. I've been accused of a lot right. of things. But no, my, the, let the little record show the first gap is from the moderator. All right. The, the question from Mr. For Mr. Trump. My question to you is when your website covered that, if you will, there was a repeated reference in an article to the and criticism of the reporters who were referred to repeatedly as the CNN Jews. Repeated references. And I'm curious what in the world that had to do, the fact that they were Jewish, with a story about Donald Trump and an open microphone. Well, and, actually. And that gets to the heart of what so many people, the problem they have with you. Well, let me tell you something. We have to start talking openly about any subject, and we have to have freedom of speech in this country. And there is a problem in America with a very uh, strong, powerful, uh, tribal group that dominates our media and dominates our international banking. Uh, Ms. Clinton has seven major international banking and media supporters. Uh, that this the largest money that she's getting, which is billions and billions of dollars. The seven largest are all uh, people who support the tribalist bankers, who support the Federal Reserve. That's the reality of it. And if we don't understand that and face up to that, then we can't deal with problems. I think I, I'm not opposed to all Jews. I think there's a lot of great. In fact, a lot of Jews I honor. But let me tell you something. I'm against Jews or anybody else that puts the interest of some other place, another country, over our own country that is controlling and dominating the media, which is tell, teaching black people and, and inspiring black people to hate white people and inciting them to violence, like the Black right, Lives your, Matter, your which time, has been supported your time by the media. Has expired. That's my, that's what, my issue. What, and, and, what and, and they do fact, control Your time has expired. What did the fact that they were Jewish have to do with this repeated reference to CNN Jews? It's got everything to do with it. A good example is the fact, if you take a look at Trump and the neocons, 
uh, we have a, a cabal in this government that literally controls our foreign policy. Syria is a country, I've been there, and unlike probably any of these other candidates, I've been there in Libya and many other nations and lectured at universities. Syria is a country with three million Christians. Syria is a secular government, non-jihadist. It was just admitted by Clinton that our government's been supporting Saudi Arabia, which she admits was supporting ISIS, that the lady should be getting the electric chair being charged with treason. She's saying that we, sh we are known that Syria is supporting right. ISIS. Right. Let me finish. That Syria is supporting ISIS. She knew this. She told it secretly to Goldman right. Sachs I've, I've and her emails, right, but she I've, didn't tell the public. Thank you. So I've got to move on. Let's get the a only question. Reason for that I've is got to move on, Mr. Duke. Mr. Bustani, a question for you from Cynthia Arsenault. Americans shouldn't have to live in fear of losing everything just because they get sick. With the high cost of prescription drugs, Congressman Bustani, why did you vote against the Medicare Prescription Drug Price Negotiation Act of 2007, which would have allowed negotiating lower drug prices for Part D? Well, it's very simple. Uh, by doing it that way, you would basically force a restriction in the formulary. We see that in the VA system today, where the, the, uh, the formulary is very restricted as to what our veterans can get. I think that's wrong. It's a terrible way to treat our veterans who serve this country. Why would we want to replicate that for seniors? We know that the system that was enacted, whereby negotiations go on on a regular basis among the plans, has actually driven some of those costs down. It actually brought the, the cost of the program down overall to the taxpayer. Now, the reason that drug prices are going up right now is because of the new restrictions that have come about because of the Affordable Care Act. What has happened is you've got empowered uh, uh, bene uh, pharmacy benefit managers that are using rebate structures, and they are ru running up the costs. The generics have been restricted because of regulations. Ingredients in the generics are restricted. This is driving the cost. It's not the Medicare prescription drug plan, which has a very high satisfaction rate among seniors. All right, your time There's is There's a separate, expired. separate reason that Thank those costs you. are going you, up. You don't want to restrict right. the formulary. Thank you, sir. Let's go to um, a question for, no, we've got to move on. Let's go to uh, Mr. Uh, Fleming, a question for him from Doug Warner. Uh, sir, uh, you weren't alone in voting against Superstorm Sandy relief package. You cited it was loaded full of uh, port projects. Now, your critics could call that hypocritical with Louisiana in uh, need of help now. Can you be as specific as possible? Can you name two projects in that bill, the Superstorm Sandy relief bill, that stopped you from voting for it? Oh, uh, look, uh, again, as a conservative, I believe that we should have direct relief for anyone who, who needs it. In the case of New Jersey and New York, there was a need for $17 billion of relief, and I voted for it when it was in the, in the House. However, when it came out of the Senate, there was added to it $33 billion that had nothing to do with New Jersey or New York or uh, Hurricane Sandy. I, my colleagues are supporting our flood relief that we're doing. So I did the right thing. I did the fiscal responsible thing. But I do want to address one more thing about Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy, the plain answer to his question is he switched parties when this state became a Republican state. Uh, he endorsed John Kerry in 2004 for president, one of the biggest liberals there is. He opposed the Bush middle tax, class, uh, tax cuts and he supported a gun ban. So I don't know which uh, Mr. Kennedy we're talking to tonight. If we switch back to Democrat Party, will he switch back as well? A very, very brief response. The, the, the brain is an amazing organ. And don't call me a liar. It's, the brain is an amazing organ. It starts working in the mother's womb, and it doesn't stop until you get elected to Congress. Now, I think I've answered John's question. I like John. But John is the ultimate Washington insider. He's been there for four terms. He's changed nothing. If you haven't changed anything in four terms, it's time to move on. Right. The only thing and he speaking, wants to move speaking, on to speaking, 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 is the United he's States He's been in Senate. politics over 30 years, and he hasn't changed right. anything in politics. I think, I think you he both, made, ultimate think you both made your point. Thank okay. you, gentlemen. Uh, Ms. Fayard from Greg Merriweather. Uh, Ms. Fayard, uh, you and Donald Trump apparently have something in common in this campaign. You've both lost endorsements for something that you said or stood by. Um, I think people on both sides have said one of your main ads purposely pulls Foster Campbell out of context uh, when he was referring to David Duke. Uh, my question is, speaking specifically to your ad, what did Campbell side with Duke on? 
So thanks, Greg, for that question. I'm glad to finally address this. First off, let me say that nothing in that ad is untrue. Foster may not like it, but it's because he can't explain it. And frankly, neither can I. There's no context in 2016 is it, that it's ever acceptable to have a conversation in either a private or public forum, as this was, with a white supremacist, and then have a handshake that solidifies that. And this has happened multiple times on the campaign trail. I also find it laughable that Foster sets up here and talks about what a good Democrat he is. But the crux of that ad is that he refuses to even say Secretary Hillary Clinton's name when given multiple opportunities. You know, this is what people do not like about career politicians. The flip-flopping, the tap dancing. Foster will say something like he's in nobody's shirt pocket but the people's. But the truth of the matter is he's lined his campaign contribution coffers with people who give money that own the companies that he regulates. Like the Wash Greater Washtabal Parish Water Company that right now spews brown water into people's faucets on a daily basis, but Foster continues to take money from the president of that company, does right. nothing you're, about it. You're, thank you, your so th there's Time nothing in the ad that's untrue. And right. I would say that there's no context in which it's acceptable to have a conversation, whether public or private, with someone like David Duke. All right, let, let's uh, move on. Let me give, hold on. I think it was really a, a directed to Mr. Campbell more than anyone else. We've got to move on, gentlemen, please. I'm in the middle of this, too, now. Well, I'd, I'd like to uh, answer that, if I could. Yeah, I'll give you quickly an opportunity. Well, first of all, it is a, <laughs> it's a damn lie. It's not just a lie. It's a damn lie. Uh, I have nothing in common with David Duke other than we're probably breathing. That's uh, what I have in common with him. But let me tell you what other people think about it. Governor John Bell Edwards just released a deal a while ago saying that he supported me, that she should have never said that. Uh, Senator Wesley Bishop uh, said that it's ridiculous. Uh, a lady named uh, Felicia Kahn, a leader in civil right. rights in New Orleans, Ms. said it was Campbell, ridiculous. I'm, it Mr. is Campbell, ridiculous. And she to, knew I've it. She's doing on. anything Thank she you, can to win. Thank you very She's much, losing. sir. Thank and you, sir. I've got to move on. Let's get a question about Social Security from Cynthia Arsenault. Certainly, certainly. I've been called a supremacist. I have a right to respond to that kind of attack because that's a typical attack that I get by the media. I'm not a supremacist. I believe in equal rights for all. The problem they have with me is I believe white people also deserve human rights. They shouldn't face discrimination in jobs, promotions, and scholarships. And we have a media that puts out hate propaganda against white people and tries to incite okay. hatred in black people across America right. against white people Thank and you. against I've, police I've officers. I've got to move on, everybody, or we won't get some more ground. A very on important question question. question on Social Security from Cynthia Arsenault. If something doesn't change by 2030, the Social Security Trust Fund will be in big trouble. Social Security benefits could be cut by 25 percent. How would you deal with this? By raising the retirement age, or would you consider eliminating the payroll tax cap so that the wealthy will pay more into the tax system? All right, and we go first to Mr. Campbell. Mr. Campbell? Oh, you, Mr. Campbell, you the did, Social Security. You're up here first, sir. Okay. Would you repeat the question? Certainly. We all know that Social Security is in a crisis situation, and if we don't do something about it right now, by the year 2030, the Social Security Trust Fund could be in big trouble with benefits being cut by as much as 25 percent. How would you deal with this? Would you raise the retirement age, or would you consider eliminating the payroll tax cap so that the wealthy is putting more into the system? <clears throat> well, let me talk about Social Security anyway. It was uh, formed in 1935 by Franklin Roosevelt, uh, and all the Republicans were against it. They were against it, said it was terrible. Well, it, it's, I think it's good, and a lot of people have paid in, and I want to make sure they get their benefits from it. I might would look at a payroll tax uh, cap removing it because uh, or uh, exempting it for a while or move it up where wealthier people pay more. Uh, today they don't pay as much or proportionally as the average working folks. I would might look at that, but there's one thing for sure. I'm on Social Security side. I'll do everything I can to keep it. There's no way in the world that I want to see anything done with Social Security or Medicare. Two things that Democrats passed and Republicans both opposed. All right, let's go to Mr. Duke next. Social Security, Same sir. Question. Oh. Well, first off, this is a good example of the screwed up nature of this controlled economy and this controlled government in this country. 
Anybody who pays into a program deserves to get back what they paid in. And Social Security has been robbed by the politicians in terms of the welfare system, including a lot of people in the welfare system who are not there because they're needy, it's because they don't want to work. And that's the reality. There's a lot of people who don't take responsibility for their lives. Those who need help, I'm all for that. And we have to protect the Social Security system and absolutely this is what's got to come first. Secondly, we have millions and millions of illegal immigrants never paid a penny in taxes getting huge amounts of Social Security. A majority of them actually end up on the welfare rolls, and yet we can't pay our elderly what they deserve for a lifetime of work and paying taxes. All we right. have crisis with property here, 15 seconds, with cri crisis with property here in Louisiana where a lot of people are losing their house for good, but this government's building houses all over the world in other countries for people. It should be the American people who are taxpayers and work hard. They should get the first release, America first. All right. Thank you, Mr. Duke. Mr. Bustani, what do you do about Social Security? Well, Social Security is a very important trust, a very important promise for seniors to keep seniors out of poverty. And we have to do everything we can to save it. Here's the problem. The way it's structured is Current workers pay payroll tax that covers current beneficiaries. And when the program was first put in place, we had many, many more workers for each beneficiary on Social Security. Today, we only have two workers for each person taking Social Security. And that's the actuarial problem we have with this. The only way we can fix this is to get people, more people working, get the, get the economy growing, getting more people working, paying more payroll tax in in order to cover today's beneficiaries. That means getting people off of welfare. I've done that. I rewrote the 96 Welfare Act last year. We've, we passed some of that through the House. We need a senator who can get this done, and that's why I'm running for the United States Senate. We have to get more people working. Anybody who's able body should be working, paying into Social Security, and if we get that ratio up, we can clearly fix it. Any tinkering with the uh, retirement age should be done way, not with current seniors or near retirees, but those much right. earlier in, in life so they can make plans accordingly. That's something Thank we'll have to discuss with you. the American Your time people time has expired, forward. Mr. Fleming. Well, as a, as a true conservative and as a fiscal con conservative, I understand uh, that Social Security uh, is in difficulty right now. It's in fiscal difficulty. But I also understand and recognize that we made a promise to the American people. Uh, and as long as I'm in Congress, I will save and protect Social Security. Anybody who is on it or in the foreseeable future to be on it, we need to guarantee that it's there for them. However, there's been a lot of fiscal manage mismanagement in Washington, but it comes to this state too. For instance, Mr. Kennedy is from the Hillary Clinton School of Economics, who believes in taking money from bondholders and then leaving us our Superdome in a situation where taxpayers lose $108 million. We can't allow this sort of fiscal irresponsibility up in Washington. We don't even need it here. Again, if you were my chief financial officer, I would have fired you a long time ago, John. All right, Ms. Fayard. So my generation has more at stake than almost anybody when it comes to entitlement reform. And as your next United States Senator, I can promise that I'm going to work hard to stabilize Social Security so we make good not only just the promise that we've promised our seniors, but the covenant that we've made with the hardworking people of this great country of ours. We're also going to work to make sure that Medicare is stabilized. And we're going to do that through common sense reforms. I believe one thing that was mentioned was the payroll, um, raising the payroll cap. And certainly very wealthy people, including Warren Buffett and others, have agreed with this approach because it's time for people to start paying their fair share. But we also have to remain growth focused. One way that we can do that is stop subsidizing corporations by paying deflating wages. We need to raise the minimum wage, make it a livable wage, get people working, get money in their pockets to spend to power our economy. And I'm going to work hard in Congress to make sure that this happens. All right. And uh, finally, Mr. Kennedy. You know, when you're, when you're getting kicked in the rear, it usually means you're in front. Um, let me, let me, uh, let me ask, answer the question, and let me be very clear. If I represent you in the United States Senate, I will protect your Social Security. May, may, look, there's no debate about this. People deserve to get the Social Security they pay for. You know why Social Security is in trouble? I'll tell you why. Because President Barack Obama and Secretary Hillary Clinton, when she was in the Senate, and the Ritz-Carlton Democrats, and the big government Republicans 
stole the money out of the Social Security Trust Fund and spent it on something else. If you go to the Social Security Trust Fund, you know what you find? You find the big old IOU. Now let me tell you where you get the money instead of raising any kind of taxes. Number one, we spend $157 billion a year of your tax money at the federal level on consultants. Get rid of 20% of them, we can save $30 billion a year. We got 2.7 million right. federal your time, employees. Your time has expired. We I was have, about to make we, a great point. Have, I'm sure you were, sir. Greg Merriweather's got a very quick question on the Supreme Court. Everybody's got 15 seconds to answer it or we won't get to closings. Uh, let's well, go with Mr. Question, Bustani. Mr. Bustani first. And, and about these crazy Mr. Wars Bustani first. East. You can make it unclosed. We're running out of time. Please, Mr. Bustani. Do you, share a, do you have to share a belief system on a certain set of issues to approve a Supreme Court nominee? And what's an issue-specific question you would want to ask a potential Supreme In Court In 15 justice? seconds, sir. First of all, do they respect the Constitution and the separation of powers? I do not want an activist judge. I want judges who basically uh, adjudicate on the law as it exists. Secondly, honor the Second Amendment. And thirdly, pro, pro All right, life. Mr. Campbell, quickly, please. I think Congress uh, or the Senate ought to do their job. Anybody that gets nominated, whether it's a Republican president or a Democratic uh, president, deserves a vote. But I would make sure that this nominee or this man, the future uh, justice. All right, we've got, we've got to move on, please, sir. Mr. Duke, next. I will be Donald Trump's most loyal advocate to make sure his nominees go to the Supreme Court. And if by chance he's not elected, I think he will win. I hope he does win. I will absolutely oppose any of, of any of these uh, nominees right. of Hillary that are trying to destroy our Constitution and destroy to go, this country. Fayard. Sure, uh, the Senate needs to do its job under the Constitution and provide advice and consent and hold hearings so we can learn more about the nominees. And I, my number one criteria for any Supreme Court justice is be that they respect right, the Constitution. I, I will only confirm strict constructionists like Scalia who are 100% pro-life, 100% Second Amendment, pro-gun, and absolutely conservative. All right, and uh, Mr. Kennedy. The uh, question I'm going to ask a potential nominee is whether he or she agrees with, uh, with the uh, views of Justice Scalia. And if the answer is no, I'm not going to vote for the nominee. All right, we, we have an extra minute here that, uh, that we, actually we only have 45 seconds, so I'll tell you what I will do in the interest of making sure everybody gets their time, is everyone's got 45 seconds for a closing comment. We, by, again, this was by luck of the draw that we chose the order, and it goes first to Mr. Campbell with your closing remarks, sir. I want to thank Dillard University for putting this event on tonight and thank my family for staying with me and supporting me during this campaign. I'm a former teacher, a small business owner, and a farmer. I want a better Louisiana for all our people. That's why I've been in public service all my life. Governor John Bell Edwards has endorsed me because he knows I have the courage to stand up and fight for people. After eight years of Bobby Jindal's destruction, I want to bring our tax dollars home to invest in our people, I raise a minimum wage, and finally pass equal pay for women. I am asking for your vote because I want to be a voice of the people, not the powerful. God bless you. God bless Louisiana, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much, and thanks for listening. Mr. Fleming. Well, thank you for having us uh, here tonight. I am the one true conservative here tonight uh, among all of these candidates. Um, I uh, want to go to Washington, take Louisiana values to Washington. I grew up in a home in which my dad died suddenly while I was still in high school. I became overnight the breadwinner for the family. Uh, I uh, joined the military. I became a, a doctor, and I created 500 Louisiana jobs. I came through adversity to develop, to enjoy, to promote my American dream, and now I want to go to Washington, to the U.S. Senate, to fight for Louisiana families and your American dream. All right, Ms. Fayard. For those of you still watching tonight, you just have to ask yourself one question. Are any of the men on this stage truly going to change Washington, D.C.? It seems in my estimation we've got two current congressmen, both of whom are doctors, that are part, because of their offices, part of the cultural corruption in D.C. right now. We also have a state treasurer who pretends to be more like a publicity hound and has never met a check that he won't sign with your money. We have Foster Campbell who spent four decades stomping around this state as a chameleon, not knowing which way his tap dance and shoes are going to take him. And we have a snake in David Duke. So truly, if you're focused on the past, you've 
you've got a lot of choices selection. But if you're focused on the future, you've got one. It's me, Caroline Fayard. I'm not a good old boy and I'm not beholden to any special interests. I know no favors except to the people of Louisiana. Let me work for you in the United States Senate. I'll work for you and your families on equal pay for equal work, raising the minimum wage, and making sure our oil and gas coast gets working again. Thank you so much. Mr. Kennedy. This election is not about me, and it's not about any of my fellow candidates up here. This election is about change. Now, you either like the direction that the Washington insiders have taken America, or you don't. I don't. Here's our chance to fix it. With respect, you can't fix stupid, but you can vote it out. Send me to the Senate to fight for you. I will not let you down. My name is John Kennedy, and my ballot number is 13. God bless you. All right, Mr. Duke. You know, the best way to tell who's an insider and who the the, the big boys, the, the powerful bankers, and the other people who are controlling this country, and they control most of campaign money, is look at their campaign bank accounts. I'm the only candidate in this state, in this stage, that has not taken a penny in PAC money, a penny in special interest money. I'm going to represent you. And notice something. There was a demonstration out here against me by the Black Lives Matter radicals. Why is that? They, they weren't demonstrating. They don't even know the names of these other guys and lady or a woman, but why? Because I stand up for you. The Black Lives Matter movement calls for the murder of police officers. They say, death to police and kill the police. I defend you. I defend police officers. I defend our country from these radicals who are destroying America. And it is time we stand up now. This is the tipping point. We're getting outnumbered and outvoted in our own nation. Unless we stand right. up now, our Thank children have no you, sir. future. And finally, uh, Mr. Bustani. My name is Charles Bustani. As a heart surgeon, I have the trust of my patients. And serving the 3rd Congressional District of Louisiana, I'm a conservative who's actually gotten results. Go to charlesbustani.com and you'll see some of the things I was able to get done on a range of issues for our district, our state, and our country. November 8th is coming, and you're going to have to ask yourself, who do you trust to represent us in the United States Senate? I ask for your support. I ask for your trust. I will fight hard on the big issues. Our national security is at risk. Our economy is stalled. Our values are being questioned. Who do you trust? Charles Bustani. Go to charlesbustani.com. I'm number two on the ballot. I ask for your support. Thank you. All right. Um, candidates, forgive me. Um, this is on me because we have four networks we're trying to join. I made a timing error. So we've got about 45 seconds left for everybody's answer. Let me throw one out, starting with Mr. Kennedy. We'll go down the row. And that is this question. If your candidate for president doesn't win, would you see your role as compromising or as standing your ground and preventing their agenda? I have 45 seconds. 40, 40 seconds, sir. Um, if I'm supporting Donald Trump. Uh, if Donald Trump doesn't win, I suspect President, uh, our President of the United States will be Hillary Clinton. I mean, no disrespect in saying this, but God help us. Um, I, I'm go I can work with anybody. I've got the, a legislative record to prove it. But uh, I have principles, and I'm not going to sacrifice those principles. Now, the first thing I'm going to do uh, when I get to the Senate is ask every one of my colleagues, Democratic and Republican, let's go to lunch, let's go to dinner. I don't want to just meet them in their office. I want to break bread together. Maybe it's a Louisiana thing with the food. And I want to understand them, what their motivations are, what their interests right. are. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Fleming. Well, I have to tell you, as the one true conservative here tonight, uh, the American people are, are over the moon angry at what's going on in Washington. Washington is rigged. We know this. We see what's happening with Hillary Clinton uh, and others. So look, as co-founder of the House Freedom Caucus, as somebody who stood up to my own party leadership as well as Democrats, I'm going to fight for what's right. I'm going to fight for our constituents. I'm going to fight for our principles, our conservative Louisiana principles, no matter who is president of the United States. All right, Ms. Fayard. I'm always going to put the interests of the people of Louisiana first. I'm not going to be trading on partisan political ego. I'm going to work hard with anybody who wants to make sure that the American dream remains bright and beautiful for all. Mr. Duke. Fleming's right. It is rigged, and he's part of it. 
All these Republicans and Democrats are part of this system that's destroying this country. If you want another 40 years or 50 years, I don't think we have that much time in America, of destruction of all of our American values, our principles, our freedoms, our rights, our prosperity, then vote for one of these people. If you really want some real change, not somebody who's going to work with Ms. Clinton if she gets elected, but will fight her every step of the way and stand up for you, stand up for your family and your heritage and your freedom and your prosperity in this country. If that's what you want, if you want a real change, you know who to vote for, and it's me, David Duke, for U.S. Senate. All right, Mr. Campbell, your response, please. Sir, would you be the question again to remind everybody at home is if your candidate for president were not elected, would you see your role as being a compromiser or would your more important role be to block, obstruct most of that person's agenda? What he just said is what's wrong with Louisiana. We've had enough David Vitters who had no friends in the legislature and had one friend in Washington who fought everything. We're a poor state. Of course I'll work with whoever gets to be president. I owe that to the people of the state of Louisiana. We need somebody to help this state. We're a poor state. Fighting people all times, when they're right, you fight them, doesn't do anything. Doesn't do anything. I will fight for the people of the state of Louisiana to make sure we get out of poverty, make sure we have better schools, better roads, you name it. I'm on the people's side. Yes, I will use good common sense in doing the right things for Louisiana. And Mr. Bustani. Well, I support Donald Trump, first off, and I hope he wins. But let me say this. Judge me by my record. I'm a conservative who gets results. I've actually gotten legislation passed that solves problems. I've worked with party leaders, I've worked with the opposite party, as long as it didn't violate my principles. When John Boehner opposed me in getting two new veterans clinics, I won, and those veterans clinics are under construction today for our veterans who serve this country. At times, we have found ways to work together to solve problems, such as revamping our customs laws, to take care of the seafood industry that was being hammered by foreign seafood uh, producers from China and other places. We solved that problem, it became law in January. I'm a conservative who gets results, that's what the people of Louisiana are looking for in the gridlock. Let's solve problems. Let's really get this country back on the right track. And that's why I'm asking to be your next United States Senator. I'm Charles Bustani. Everybody, I don't know if um, we've got about a minute left here. Let's just go down the line here. Mr. Kennedy, who are you voting for for president? I'm voting for Donald Trump. Um, how long do I have, John? Pretty much. That's it? I'm voting for Donald Trump. All right, Mr. Fleming. Uh, Donald Trump. Secretary Hillary Clinton. I'm voting for Donald Trump because he's the only guy up there that's really fighting against this rigged system. And I'm going to be right there fighting for him as well and fighting in the U.S. Senate for you. All right, Mr. Campbell. The Democratic nominee, Hillary Clinton. All right, thank you, sir. And finally, Mr. Bustani. I've already voted for Donald Trump because I'm very concerned about who will name the next bunch of Supreme Court justices and lower court justices. That's why I supported Donald Trump. All right, candidates, I really thank you very much for indulging me there at the, little, at the end, whereas we try again to get this to work for four different uh, television networks across the state. It's a little difficult to time it out. It's not like the Presidential Election Commission where you just kind of wrap it all up. So I, I, genuinely, um, I genuinely appreciate your patience there at the end. Thanks to Cynthia Arsenault, Doug Warner, and Greg Merriweather, my colleagues. Also, we want to thank Dillard University for uh, hosting us here this evening. And reminder, Election Day is next Tuesday. It's not Saturday. We're not always used to that, but a presidential election, it is next Tuesday. I suspect that we'll see two of these folks up here uh, in a month or so uh, as we prepare for the runoff. Look for the results on, uh, by the way, your local Raycom media station. Thank you so much for watching, and good night. I'd shake the hand, but I'm getting a cold. And I don't want that to makes two of us, actually.